really cleared out when he's like absent. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did have students. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. So my name is Tristan Lynn. I work at Iowa College Aid. Um, I work in our scholarship and grant area where we administer all the state-funded scholarships and grants. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the FAFSA, um, talk to you about financial aid, what is financial aid, the different types of financial aid, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the FAFSA. I see some familiar faces from the Europe conference a few months ago. Um, if you remember that conference, I got through about half the slides and we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to speed it up as fast as I can this time so we don't run out of time. Um, but here's the agenda. We're just going to talk what is financial aid, um, talk about the different federal programs that are out there, Iowa programs, talk about what is the FAFSA, <laughs> dig into that FSA ID, um, look at eligibility criteria, dependency criteria, um, talk more about parents, what parents need to be on the FAFSA, what parents don't need to be on the FAFSA, um, talk about financial aid, financial information on the FAFSA, and then we'll talk about Iowa College Aid's application, which is the Iowa Financial Aid application, which you can link to right as soon as the FAFSA is over with. And then if we have time, we'll go through some scenarios and see if you guys were falling asleep or really paying attention to what I was saying. <laughs> All right. So what is financial aid? Basically, it's just money. It's funding to help you pay for college. Um, financial aid comes in a few forms. There's free money, so scholarships and grants, that's money that you don't have to pay back. That's money that comes from the institution itself, the college, the university, um, comes from the state, Iowa College Aid, or comes from the Federal Department of Education. Then there's college work study. That's money you have to work for, work in the name. Uh, and then there are student loans. So there's student loans from federal resources. That's your typical subsidized, non-subsidized student loans that you always hear about. Then your private student loans, those are through private companies. Um, and then even some schools have their own institutional student loans that will help students afford their institutions. So some of the federal programs, we have the federal Pell Grant. Um, basically your EFC, or the number that the FAFSA calculates, needs to be uh, below 5,500, 5,576, um, and students could get a maximum award of 6,195 if it's zero. So it works on a sliding scale, depending on how much, uh, how high the EFC is. Is that maximum amount per semester? That's per year, and that's the 1920. Amount. Um, find out what the 2021 amounts are. Uh, generally, around December uh, is when they release the numbers for the next year. So, typically, what happens is the EFC range goes up slightly, um, and the maximum award goes up a couple percent. Then we have the federal SEOG grant or the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. This is a grant where the funds just give schools a pot of money and say, give it to the media students. So some schools define needy students a different way than other schools do. They're helping a student and they have an SEOG from one school, and it's not a guarantee that they're going to have it from other schools that they've applied to. Then talking about our federal student loans, you got your subsidized, your unsubsidized, and then there's the parent plus loans. So the subsidized and unsubsidized loans, those are loans that are in the student's name only. There's no credit requirement for the students. Pretty much a guarantee for the students. Uh, no credit check is required, anything like that. Subsidized, basically, the feds subsidize the interest of all the students in school. Unsubsidized, they don't, so interest does accrue right after that first payment is made on those loans. Then we have a Parent PLUS loan. This is for loans for the parents to take out to help fund the student's education. There is a credit check requirement for this one, um, and the loan is in the parent's name only, so the student has nothing to do with this other than the fact that they're attending school. So the Parent PLUS loan does require a credit check. If the parents are denied a Parent PLUS loan, students could be eligible for some additional unsubsidized loan that would help them out. So if the students are in a pinch, the parents don't think they're going to get approved, sometimes it's best for the parent to get denied for that loan so that the student can take out more money in the student's name without having to take out any private loans or going to other resources like that. Then we've got our state programs. We have a lot of state programs. We're going to disperse over $80 million next year in state programs. Uh, our biggest program is the Iowa Tuition Grant Program. Uh, these are for students who are attending private not-for-profit or proprietary schools in the state of Iowa. Uh, EFC has to be below 15000 uh, and the deadline for the FAFSA is July 1st. So the FAFSA will open up October 1st of this year for students for the 2021 school year. Um, and the deadline for most of our programs is July 1st. 
We have two community college programs, um, the Iowa Vocational Technical Tuition Grant and the Kidney Grant. They have varying EFC criteria, but the deadline is July 1st. Um, these are for students that are going to enroll in CTE or career and technical education programs. Um, all students enrolled in CTE programs are eligible for Vote Tech. Kidney Grant has a specific list of eligible programs um, based on high demand um, jobs. We do have a slew of other programs. We have the National Guard Education Assistance Program, which I believe has changed its name to the National Guard Service Scholarship. And that's for any member of our National Guard here in Iowa. Education and Training Voucher Program, that's a federally funded program for students who aged out of the foster care system or were adopted after the age of 16. So if you have any of those students, you want to make sure that they're applying for that uh, education training voucher. Their aftercare workers will work with them as well. Um, we're in constant communication with DHS and the aftercare community um, to uh, get those foster care students to apply for that scholarship. We have the Governor Terry E. Brainstad Iowa State Fair Scholarship. This is the scholarship that's funded by um, Governor Brainstad. Um, we typically get two to three of these a the later year. Students are required to complete essays. So a lot of essays in our application. Um, minimum work requirements. It's, it's a lot of work. We have about 100 students apply for this every year. Um, and like I said, we give away two or three. The amount changes based on how much money is in the account for us. All Iowa Opportunity Scholarship. This is a scholarship that we get thousands upon thousands of applications for, and we can only get hundreds of students. Um, these are for students who have graduated high school within the last two years, have above a 2.5 GPA requirement. So we do reach out to all the high schools in the state of Iowa to get those GPA verifications after the student applies. Um, the priority criteria is students that are in the foster care system will be students who were involved in your care of the program, so they will be a priority criteria as well, and students that are involved in trio programs at their schools. Typically, we don't make it past the uh, foster care trio population before we have to start saying, okay, you can only go to students with a zero EFC, so the neediest of the students. Uh, we just don't get enough funding. That's kind of how it is, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to give it away to all thousands of kids, but we just don't have the money to. And then our two brand new programs for this year, uh, the Future Ready Iowa Grant and the Future Ready Iowa Last Dollar Scholarship. I'm sure what you've heard about it, you've heard mostly about the Last Dollar Scholarship. Uh, the grant I'm gonna quickly go over, that's for students who are coming back to school who haven't been in school for the past two years. So these are for people who are going into specific high need fields uh, for a baccalaureate degree who already have half of their credits earned that they're transferring in or going back to school. And it's a certain amount It'll fluctuate every year. The first year, I believe it's around $3,000 or $4,000 for each student going back to school. So it's a way to get and entice students who have dropped out to go back and finish their master's degree. The last hour scholarship, this is the pays for your tuition and pays for mandatory fees at all community colleges and two of our private colleges in the state of Iowa, St. Luke's College and University College of Health Science here in Des Moines. Um, this one is also for specific high need fields, and it's only for associate's degrees or lower. Uh, the high need field is uh, the list is going to be changing on an annual basis. So if you go to our website on the last college scholarship page, there is a link that will take you to a list per college of what programs each college offers. So what the community colleges in your area, um, they're mainly in healthcare driven, so nursing uh, or a, technical healthcare programs, um, welding, farmers, ranch managers, uh, programs like that. They're all career technical education driven, so more than likely the students can be eligible for a couple of our other programs, and then we'll fill in the rest of the future. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question on the last dollar scholarship. Sorry if you explained this. So say like I had a student who was interested in nursing, and that is a high need field, yep. and they were interested in Mercy, so when determining if they get that, like one, I guess, um, are there like specific qualifications for that, like um, EFC, um, and then would it take like their, if they get the Pell Grant, and then um, do they have to take like the 5,500 in loans before that? Okay. So, lots of questions. Yeah, you're fine. So there's two eligible populations for the Last Dollar Scholarship Program. It's students who are immediately graduating college and enrolling full time in the fall, right after they graduate. Uh, sorry, graduate high school. Immediately in the fall, as soon as they graduate high school, 
Um, they have to be full time. There's no EFC requirements in the last double scholarship. So a family making five million dollars could be eligible for this program. Family making zero dollars is still eligible for the program. It's going to pay all of their tuition and all of their mandatory fees. The second population is students that are over the age of 20. We calculate that age on July 1st of the preceding year of the academic year. So for 2021, which is the students you will be assisting, they have to be 20 by July 1st of 2020. So lots of 20s in that statement. But July 1st of 2020 have to be 20, and then they'll qualify for last dollar scholarship or the students that you're going to be helping are students that are immediately graduating from high school. So they'll fall into that group. Okay. 
All right, for all of the programs listed on the screen, except for Last Dollar Scholarship, they require the additional Iowa financial aid application, which can be completed as soon as the file set is completed. It'll have a link there that says you want to start your state application, that's what they'll click to be able to apply for the National Guard through the Future Ready Iowa grant. For the Last Dollar Scholarship, the only requirement for that is they complete the FAFSA. That's it. So as long as they do the FAFSA, they're good to go. Any more questions on programs? <laughs> All right, so let's dive into the FAFSA. So what is the FAFSA? It's the free application for federal student aid. Keyword being free, students should never have to pay for service to have the FAFSA completed. I'm preaching on the choir here, you all know. It's free, 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 free. So it determines the expected family contribution, or the EFC, or the number that the feds have determined that students and their families should be able to pay for college. It's never right. I'll be honest, it's, the, the number's never accurate, but it's a way to account for everybody and treat everybody the same. Um, it's used to apply for federal, state, and some institutional financial aid. It's available October 1st, so for your students who are going to be graduating in the spring of 2020, um, it's available October 1st of 2019, so it's just right around the corner. Um, a lot of schools, specifically our big state schools, have priority deadlines. Um, what that means is that's that federal SEOG pot money that they have. They typically establish a priority deadline to say, you need to complete your FAFSA before this, because typically they run out of money really quick. I know Iowa, Iowa State, they're like in December or January. So it's, it's only giving students a couple months to complete the FAFSA to guarantee that they're gonna get the most money possible. So the sooner the student can complete, can complete the FAFSA, the better. You can complete the FAFSA at fafsa.ed.gov um, and the federal student, aid, federal student aid ID is used to sign the FAFSA. So those of you who have been around as long as I have, you'll remember the FAFSA pin, the little four digit number that you had to use to sign. Now it's become a username and login. So it's just like every other platform that you use. So federal student aid ID, this is the legal signature for the FAFSA. Student and parent are both required um, to get an FSA ID in order to sign the FAFSA. Uh, key piece of this is they both need separate email addresses to apply for an FSA ID. Um, for high school students, make sure they're not using their high school email address because it does go invalid after a year. We send reminders after their first year of college to say, hey, you applied for scholarships last year, you need to apply again. We send reminders, the feds send reminders, the only information we have is what they put on the maps in every year. So it's key that students are not using their high school email addresses so that we can kind of help them out through the rest of their time in college. You can get your FSA ID at fsaid.gov. I got ahead of myself, make sure you're using a unique email address and make sure it's something accessible because students are going to forget what their password name was, they're going to forget what their username was. Make sure it's an email address that they use all the time um, so that it's accessible to them because if they are filling out the FAFSA and they need to retrieve a password or something and then get it on their phone on an email, that would be ideal when somebody's helping them out the FAFSA. So kind of screenshotted what the FSA ID page looks like. Basically it's four steps. You're going to identify who you are. Um, they're going to have you fill out your profile. You're going to review and confirm everything that you've already filled out, and then you're going to be done. So kind of quickly, the pages. Identify was just your social security number, your name, um, your email address. Um, the rest is you're adding your date of birth, your actual address. You're confirming your email address, your mailing address, your telephone number. Um, the next one is a little bit trickier. You have to come up with those secret security questions that nobody ever remembers <laughs> what your favorite pet's name is. Um, so there are four challenge questions and then you have to make up the challenge question. So the biggest takeaway I can give for you on this one is to click show text. Um, so the little circle thing that I have there. You can click that so the students know what they did. Print it off for the student, have the student write it down, I think. Um, I think it randomizes it when the student doesn't remember what it is, so it will be question one the first time, question five the next time, so hopefully the students can remember what their issues are. Um, final page is just confirming all your answers, and then you have to agree that you're not going to share your FSA ID with anybody and all that. 
And then they'll send you an email verification page. Um, it'll email you a secure code so that you can confirm that the email is active right away. So ideally, the student can be checking their email while you're helping them. And get that code. <laughs> if not, it'll take about two or three days to make the same team processes. So what's it used for? It's used to complete and sign the FAFSA. Um, it's used for NSLDS, which is the National Student Loan Database, and Student Loan Stack App. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, and it'll help you import your tax information, and it'll help students go back in and make corrections on their FAFSA. Uh, students make mistakes, they make mistakes. A lot of times students want to go back in and fix something, say they didn't have a school that they wanted on their FAFSA, which they're going to have to log back in, so they want to make sure NSLDS was the National Student Loan Database. Um, you can view all the federal financial aid that you've received, so students can go in and look and see how much program they've received over their lifetime. Um, they can review all of their federal loan information, how much is due, how much interest is accrued, and who their servicer is. So the servicing thing is very complicated with financial aid, specifically with student loans. The Department of Education has five student loan servicers that they contract out to basically collect the money on their behalf. Um, so this is where students will go to figure out who they pay back for their loans. Yes? Will it um, show the federal aid offers that, that they have or only the financial aid that they've taken out? Only financial aid that was dispersed to them. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So I remember in the olden days that we used to help students do the facts that like, you could apply for a pin as you got to the end of now, is it true they have to get their FSA ID ahead of time and if so, like, how many hours ahead of time? Perfect world student comes to your office with their FSA ID. You can always complete a FAFSA without a signature. There's an option at the end, so you can apply for the FSA ID. Um, if a student comes in, they can apply for the FSA ID. It will take a couple more days to process because that will be the verified the student is in the student's ID. And that, that's one of the things, of course, the college that you'll be getting. Um, Jamie this morning talked about getting a uh, business card that'll have FSA ID and then password for schools that can keep so that they just have that with them. And then you can give one to families as well. Last thing the FSA ID is used for is studentloans.gov. So that's how students are going to sign their insurance counseling and their master plan. So you know, those are kind of legal documentation to say that you know it's a loan and they take it out to actually make the loan process so that they can get All right, let's dive more into the FAFSA. So eligibility criteria. So in order for a student to qualify for any federal student aid or state student aid, they must be uh, have their high school diploma or they must be a U.S. citizen or an eligible. Citizen. They must have a valid social security number, and if they're a male between the ages of 18 and 25 years old, um, they must register for selective service. And this is the sex that was assigned, or sex at birth. Um, they must be enrolled in an eligible degree or certificate program, so if they're enrolled in one of our state colleges, community colleges, uh, private colleges, and proprietary colleges, more than likely they're going to be eligible. Citizenship. So students have to be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen. Eligible non-citizen are U.S. residents that they have a permanent residence green card, conditional green card. Uh, they're either a uh, holder of an arrival departure record, so I-94 form from the Department of Homeland Security. So they're a refugee. They're citizens of the Department of Homeland Security as a holder of Cuban Haitian entrant or they're a holder of a valid certification from the Department of Health and Human Services that they were a victim of human trafficking. So those are kind of the criteria of citizenship and eligible non-citizenship. Eligible non-citizens must provide their alien registration number when they're completing the FAFSA, so that there'll be an A code that they put on the FAFSA. And DACA students are not eligible for federal student aid. The social security number that they've been given is only for employment, it's not for higher education or Title IV funds. Uh, they're not considered a citizen or an eligible non-citizen, uh, but they may qualify as an institutional 
scholarships and grants. So uh, scholarships and grants from the college or university themselves. Big question I get, um, parents not a legal resident uh, or an eligible citizen. Uh, parents' citizenship does not affect the student being an eligibility whatsoever. It's all about the student. Um, but if uh, parents are undocumented, they need to put zeros in for their social security number. Uh, and that's on the, the feds know not to, not to look at the IRS information for that. Um, they don't want to put in their P10 number, so if they have a or TIN number, their tax identification number, so they have a TIN number but not an SSN, just put in the zeros for the Social Security number because the Social Security Administration does checks based off of birthday, name, all of that for student and parents, and it'll flag them as, um, well, the financial aid professionals call a C code, and they'll require additional documentation at the college in order to clear that up before they can offer any financial aid. Is that, is that flag them in some way? You know, like there's only zero, like are they, the, are undocumented parents the only people putting zeros in for their social security number? No, if a student's in the, in the country and their parent still lives in another country, they don't have zeros in. So it doesn't, Flag them as they're undocumented because they're going to be more situations like that. Where it's super and do you, just because I know we'll get a lot of fear, so what is the best, what do you encourage us to tell our families if this were to come up? What I've told parents in the past Whoa. is the, the federal, the feds have never utilized FAFSA data for anything other than the administration of Title IV. In order for any other agency to be able to use FAFSA data, there's going to have to be an agreement that's made between those two agencies. There's never been anything in the history of FAFSA that they've shared information like that. Dependency is another big one. Typically not for your straight out of high school students, but after a year or two when they're in college, dependency becomes a bigger issue for them. Um, students are dependent on the FAFSA if they have to answer no to all the following questions on the next few slides, and they're independent if they can answer yes to at least one of the questions on the following slides. If they're independent, they're not required to enter their parents' information, um, but their spouse's information is required if they're married. So dependency questions, this is going to be for the 2021 FAFSA. Um, so were you born before January 1st, 1997? As of today, are you married? So the trick with that one is it's as of today, are you married? So if they're getting married tomorrow, they're, they're still going to be considered a dependent student. Uh, at the beginning of the 2021 school year, we'll be working on a master's or doctorate program. This is only if they already have their bachelor's program. If a student's planning on getting their master's degree eventually, don't put that as a yes. The schools will reverse it and soon will be dependent. Um, do you now have you do you now have or will you have children who will receive more than half their support from you uh, between such and such states? Um, do you have dependents other than your children or spouse who live with you and receive more than half your support? <coughs> are you considered active duty? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since you turned the age of 13, were both your parents deceased? Uh, were you in foster care or were you a dependent or a ward of the court? Key word in that one is or, and any time after the age of 13. So if something happened uh, after the age of 13 where both parents were deceased, student was later adopted, the student's parents were both deceased after the age of 13, so the student would still be an independent student for FAFSA so purposes. Uh, as determined by a court in your state of legal residence, are you or were you in grounds paid the minor? Does someone other than your parent or step parent have legal guardianship of you as determined by a court in your state of legal residence? Determined by a court? Nobody else? On or after July 1st, uh, were you homeless or were you self supporting and at risk of being homeless? So, yes, ma'am? Yeah, for that homeless question. Yes. If they answer yes, what kind of documentation do they have to show just that they were homeless? Okay. Um, Typically, they'll get a letter from a homeless shelter, the school will, and then they'll be able to verify that the student was homeless. If not, typically what happens is the school will require at least two forms of documentation to prove that. Um, somebody from the school, uh, somebody from their neighborhood, uh, I was financial aid, was I 
part two, so it's the So it's just be like, they didn't live with their parent, but they lived on the couch with a friend. Could that be a source of documentation from that parent that they lived with, from that family that they lived with? Could be. If I was in the school, I would definitely yeah. question that okay. um, without more information. Do you code your kids in your system as homeless? So where we and code them, we print that page and then write a letter. But we have, especially if they're in the high school, we won't necessarily, we may know that they're homeless, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they work with our homeless liaison. Oh, okay. Well, then we, I guess, then we just ask our homeless liaison to classify them as that if they're truly sleeping on someone's mm -hmm. couch to get that. Yeah, I know. Every school is going to be different. They read the regs and they have to yeah, yeah. Uh, assume their own risk. So some schools will ask for just one piece of documentation. Some schools may ask for all of it. Um, teens or parenting, are they automatically independent, even if like their own parents are kind of putting through the bills? Yes. The way the question reads is you have to be supporting your student or supporting independent with more than 50%. So if that student can prove that they're supporting their child with 50%. Are they going to have to prove it? Supporting them financially, not like, oh, I babysat my baby. Like, right. But they pay for health care, they pay for personal lunch, they pay for rent. I think that's a tricky question, Marie. Can they prove it? You can't, like, that can't be something that we can kind of, like, lead. I don't believe ethically that we can do that. Like, you have to read what it says and say, yeah. just like you said, read the question and answer it as it is. Don't lead them down the path to say, well, I don't know if they're going to check it or not. It's just, I mean, I think that's tricky. So. If, a, if a student says yes to that question, then they have to do that. Yeah. And they're 18 or 19. Typically, they're going to have to fly. And schools are going to have to Federal assistance counts as the system. Right. Okay. And that's the other thing. It's not the federal government coming to look at it. It's the school that your right. child is applying to that will come and say, prove this is up. This yeah. And that's the one that you don't want is the school to come back and go, oh, Because that's it. We, we have had that situation with kids applying on the transcript to make their REI score higher, and they didn't get it the first year because they didn't. I guess I'm kind of wondering, like, what's what's the risk in that situation? Like, you know, that that child answers, yes, I'm I'm parenting, I'm responsible. Are they? They're not going to get into the school. They're not going to get the money that they need. Like, like, what if they can't? When I said risk, I meant on the college. Yeah. So the college is going to ask for documentation, for documentation for right. the student to prove it right. until they're satisfied. Yeah. Because it's, it's ultimately their title for a, they get audited by the federal government. They got to get the program reviews. And if they would have to say that in the school, uh, it could be a financial issue. Sure. I'm, I'm more wondering about like from the from the student's perspective, like because I know I know you're getting into like ethical, like what we can do, but like my students are going to want to know what I think. Do I think that they are answering yes or no to this question? They're going to talk it through. Is it better to steer them toward being like, I, I don't know, are we erring on the side of being dependent? Are we erring on the side of like, is there a way to err? I don't know. This is my first time doing any of this, so. Ultimately, the students. It's just their interpretation the of right. the question, and then yeah. you deal with it. Answer it to the best of their abilities, and then let the college go. Generally, in most cases, if a student is considered a dependent student, they're required to put in parental information, no matter if the parent gives them money, plans on helping them with college, or some special circumstances, but the school will require additional documentation. So it's really, if the student's parents are incarcerated, uh, the student left home due to an abusive family environment, the student has, uh, does not know who the parents are, or a parent, uh, has no contact with the other parent, so the following are unacceptable reasons. These are in federal student aid code. Um, if parents simply want to refuse and don't want to put on their information, that's not a good excuse. Uh, 
parents refuse to contribute to college expenses, parents don't claim student other tax returns, um, student does not live with parents. Uh, the tax return one is a huge one. That question comes up all the time. Taxes and FAFSA are completely different. They have completely different rules. You just use your taxes to fill out your FAFSA. And if everything works out right, you don't even have to look at your taxes to fill out your FAFSA. You just link everything from the IRS. Yeah. Questions on the dependency status and putting on parental information? A lot of times, parents will ask, um, can I? I claim that my students, the rules to be claimed as an independent are, they make it very, very difficult for you to do that. For a reason, right? Because everyone can do that. Right. So. That's what the family is now in Yes. Yep. So they were filling out legal documentation to make their student emancipated minor, right. and then the student was eligible to be an student. So who will? Tool, which basically uh, they link all of their information from the IRS and it pops it right back into the lab so as it as they, um, pertains to their tax information. Students will have to enter their income from work. Additional financial information, that's where the extra payments come in. Uh, untaxed income, investments, and business or investment farms are also included. We'll talk about a little bit about each of those. Tax volume status. It'll ask if the students already completed a tax return. If they have, it, uh, the, which they should have because it's prior prior year, then it will allow the users to utilize the IRS data retrieval tool. Basically, 
think I have some screenshots here on the next step. But basically, it takes you to the IRS website. It says, warning, you're going off the BAPSA website. It takes you to the IRS website. You fill out a few pages of the IRS website. And then it will bounce you back to the BAPSA website. Um, and it will say, information transfer from the IRS. So I won't even tell the student what that number is. If a, a parent or student say they will file, um, but have not yet completed it, they can use their estimated tax information. This doesn't happen as much anymore as it used to do. Now that we have higher priority, or the student can indicate that they're not going to file a tax return or the parent. Um, and in that case, you just need to report them on the data. Anytime you're filling the FAFSA out online, if you look on the right hand side or the left hand side, this then, depending on which browser you're using, it will tell you what line to look at on the tax return, or it will give you advice on how to answer the question. A lot of times, I just have a printed off paper FAFSA so that I can read through what is the question actually asking. And then there's examples on the FAFSA website as you're helping students complete it. So if you have any questions, that's typically the first place you can go in the question. More than likely, will be answered. What happens if they click will file but have not yet completed? Like, is it like, oh, before you can't get any aid in the fall until that is actually in? Like, how does that work out? Um, it all depends on the institution. Um, so some schools have an institutional policy where they will require students who have completed their tax return before they all give them their financial aid. Other schools uh, will award and disperse off of a real final status in some tax return. So that is the kind of institution. Okay, tax return information that uh, gets put on the FAFSA, your filing status, single, head of household, married, etc. Your AGI or adjusted gross income, the U.S. income tax is paid. This is not the refund amount that they got back, it's the actual amount of federal taxes that they paid. And then the number of exceptions. All of these numbers and all of these things that they're putting on the FAFSA get put into this EFC calculation, which if you do the long form of it, it could be 25 pages long with all the charts in it. So by entering it all on the computer, the feds are sipping it through real quick, and the EFC pops up right as soon as you complete the FAFSA. So the IRS data retrieval tool, this is kind of what it looks like. You're going to get a page like this saying you already completed. You will have this button here that has a link to the IRS. <coughs> Once you click that button, you're going to get this warning that pops up that says, hey, you're leaving the FAFSA website. That warning's okay. It's a mandatory warning that they have with their agreement between the IRS and the federal student data. Then it's going to give you this information. You're going to need to put the first name, last name, social security number, date of birth, filing status, and the address. The address is the trickiest part. It has to be exactly as it was on the tax return. So a lot of times it's helpful to have a tax return with you when um, helping a student complete the FAFSA. Street, if it's spelled out street, it needs to be spelled out street. It needs to be ST if it's spelled ST. If there's periods in there, you got to have the periods. It looks at it character by character to make sure that it's exact match like you had with the IRS system. But if they miss it, and they're doing it with ICANN, it'll pop back and they'll say, this doesn't match. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> OK, then it'll go through here, and we'll say, here's what's transferring over. Do you want to transfer now, or do not transfer? Um, transfer now, because that's, that's what you do. If you say, do not transfer, we'll just take it back to the FAFSA, and you have to enter all the information that you could put to the front here. The beauty of linking from the IRS, it means less verification. So there's not going to be as much verification amount. Um, students aren't going to be required to submit copies of their financial aid tax transcripts or financial aid or income tax transcripts or a copy of their taxes um, to the financial aid office at the college. If the IRS can provide the information direct, then the colleges and universities are not required to look at those numbers again. You know, it's solid and you came from another governmental entity. Phones and transfers back. You're going to get, uh, you've successfully transmitted your information, and then it's going to give you numbers instead of transfer from the IRS. So, really, not giving numbers, instead of numbers, it's going to say transfer from the IRS. It's all security measures, so if you're helping a student and their parents don't want their student to know how much they make, if you can do this tax, the data retrieval tool then you're never going to see the numbers. 
we have students who move quite a bit. Are they, should they just put in the address that was, that the tax returns were filed at? Or does it then come off to adjust it so that? You know, address on the tax return. So it's really helpful to have just a copy of that. So even if they move, put in the address that you have at the time? Yep, at the time. And like she said, there will be a mirror that pops out if it doesn't match. Yeah. Um, income earned from work. These are wages, salaries, tips that you earn from work. Uh, they must be reported whether or not the student filed a tax return. So will file, will not file. If they earn the income from work, they need to put it on the FAFSA. Information can be found on tax forms, W-2 forms, or 1099 forms that they received from their employer. Additional financial information that's required. So I'm going to go through a list of things that benefit the EFC or make the EFC come down. And then I'm going to go through a list of things that don't benefit the EFC or make it go up. So the things that benefit the EFC are education credits, child support that's paid, any combat pay or special combat pay, any taxable earnings from federal work study jobs or other need based programs, um, taxable student grants and scholarship aid, or earnings from work under co op education program. Program Vista, AmeriCorps, and Peace Corps. Those all help and bring that DFC number down. Untaxed income, this is income that must be reported on the FAFSA, so this is going to bring your EFC up. So if you pay this to tax deferred pension and retirement savings plans, you will get a copy of this, so you have to list all the things. IRA deductions and payments to self employed income, child support received, tax within interest income, and basically it's income. Tax or untaxed, and then money received or paid on your behalf. That's where the boyfriend living in the house comes into play. So then we've got investments that students need to uh, put on their FAFSA. Um, it goes through a pre calculation, so if your EFC is below a certain amount, it will give you the option to not enter this information if you don't want to, or you can enter this information. If it says you can bypass it, bypass it. Nobody needs it, um, but it asks. Just in case you want to You're talking about that when it says, like, would you like to? Right. Okay, so they don't, if that pops up, they don't need to do Anytime it. Anytime it says, would you like? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then it'll make our lives easier, everybody's lives easier, then the student doesn't have to fret about how much is in my checking account as of today. The issue with the uh, investments piece is it says, as of today, what is in your cash savings checking account? People fret over that really hard. Being filmed, so try your best to get the most <laughs> accurate number that you possibly can. Okay. Real estate that's not including the home you live in, so if you have investment real estate elsewhere, um, trust, mutual money market funds, talking about up my accounts. A lot of times, students will look at you with blank face, they have no idea, or parents, they have no idea what that means. <coughs> that means that they don't have it. Okay. Uh, stocks, bonds, education savings accounts, 529 college savings plans. And the 529 plans are really tricky, and there's going to be a question on it later. Um, it's only for the owner of the account. So it's only counted on the owner. So if parents own it for a student, it'll be on the parents' portion of the FAFSA. Is that new? No. Okay. No. Nope. So if the grandparents own it, and it's on grandparents' FAFSA, which they don't complete on, so it's never counted until payments are made. And then it's payments on that were made on your account. Investments do not include the home you live in, any life insurance you have, retirement plans, pension funds, annuities, non-education IRAs, or COVID plans. Business and investment farms include, um, it's, so the net worth, so current value minus the debt of your businesses or your investment farms. Current value includes the fair market of your land, buildings, machinery, equipment, inventory, I think I have another slide on this. You don't include it. So, we live in Iowa, there's a lot of family farms. If the family lives on and operates the farm, it is not needed to be included on the FAFSA. Do not include the family farm on the FAFSA if the student lives on the farm, or if the student can see the farm.